Please. My name is Jay Scott. I'm one of the co-executive directors here at Allerton's Lemonade Stand. Um, so if you have suggestions for future additional lecture topics, please share them in the survey that's going to be shared with you in the chat. Or you can email them to me at j at alexslemonade.org. Um, we're always looking for new topics. If you have questions for the presenter today, you can place those in the chat on Zoom and we will answer them uh, in the order they're received at the conclusion of the lecture. I also want to send a big thank you out to General Malley from the Alex's Lemonade staff for helping us organize these lectures. I want to thank everyone for attending today. And so today's lecture, the title of it is Social Difficulties in Pediatric Brain Tumor Survivors. It's being presented by Matthew C. Hawking, PhD. Uh, Matthew is a pediatric psychologist who works in, with the Division of Oncology at CHOP and is an assistant professor of clinical psychology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Matt is also a good friend to Liz and I, and he's also the chair of the Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation's Psychosocial Grants. His research aims to better understand the neurodevelopmental consequences of having survived childhood cancer or having neurofibromatosis type one, to identify those who are at most, at most at risk for poor outcomes and to intervene in some way in order to improve the quality of life. What we're looking for you to learn, be able to learn at this lecture are, we want, we want to be able to summarize what is known and unknown about the social difficulties of pediatric brain tumor survivors, understand the role of two key social information processes in the social functioning in pediatric brain tumor survivors, and to be able to identify areas of diminished neural activity in the social brain of pediatric brain tumor survivors during social processing. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt. Thank you, Matt, for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing your lecture. All right, thank you very much, Jay. I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. Um, let's see. Well, again, thank you very much, uh, Jay and Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. It's an honor to present to you guys. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity and the invitation. Um, ALSF is a foundation that is near and dear to my heart, and uh, the Scots have been like a family for us in Philadelphia, where we don't really have any other family members. So it's been great uh, knowing them over the last nine years that we've been here. So Jay summed up the topic of what I'm gonna be talking about today, um, a little bit about our, our research program that we've been working on over the last five or six years um, and looking for a, a good discussion hopefully at the end. I have no complex to, the, to declare. So again, we're just gonna present, uh, present an overview of the social difficulties, what we know, what we don't know. Um, and then I'm gonna offer a potential reformulation of what we know about these difficulties and how to move research forward um, through the a prism of a model of social competence and also what we can learn from research on youth with autism spectrum disorder which is another disorder with known social deficits and then i'll spend some time talking to you about some of the emerging evidence in my lab uh, about the different social information processes that we are studying um, how they relate to some of the outcomes of interest um, and then some some of the neuroimaging findings that we are um, working on in, in terms of potential brain mechanisms and then some next steps. So I'll spend a little bit of time on the medical background, not a whole lot. Um, brain tumors are the second most common malignancy of childhood, um, and it's also the leading cause of cancer death in children. Um, what I wanna focus on though is that the, the five-year survival rate for all um, central nervous system tumors in this age group has improved dramatically over the last 40 years from around almost 60% to almost 74%, which is a, a big jump. Um, and you can kind of see the comparison uh, with the overall childhood cancer survival rate. And this is important because more and more uh, kids are surviving their brain tumors, and it really increases the importance of the quality of their survivorship. Kids with brain tumors are more likely to have a lot of neurodevelopmental consequences as a result of their tumor and treatment, uh, which impact the quality of their survivorship. The, the treatments uh, for brain tumors in, in childhood are typically involve some sort of multimodal approach. There's more than one therapy used oftentimes and some sort of combination of surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. And uh, the treatments that we use come with costs and survival comes with a cost. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. 
but the, the late effects, the consequences of these treatments that emerge several years after diagnosis and after the end of treatment, um, put brain tumor survivors at risk for a bunch of neurodevelopmental difficulties, neurocognitive problems, and uh, social difficulties, which I'll get into. And as a result of these late effects, pediatric brain tumor survivors have the poorest health-related quality of life among all other kinds of childhood cancer survivors. So jumping right into the social difficulties of these survivors, um, what do we know? In the child developmental literature, the gold standard for assessing social functioning is through collecting information from children's peers, the, their classmates, things like that. The methods usually involve going into classrooms and asking students, um, who are your friends? Who do you, how much do you like your, each of your classmates? Um, and then there's sometimes use something called a revised class play, where we um, get nominations for imaginary class play roles, um, like the leader of the class, the sensitive child, the child who's isolated, um, and so forth. And studies that do this for kids with cancer outside the central nervous system, so non-brain tumor, um, when, we, when you do that kind of methodology for those kids, kids with non-CNS cancer look pretty similar to their healthy peers. They have the same number of friends, they're liked about the same. However, when we do these kinds of studies for brain tumor survivors, we see a different story. Um, they, brain tumor survivors have fewer friendship nominations than peers. Um, they're seen as having greater victimization and social isolation, and they tend to be viewed as less popular and more sensitive and isolated. So quite a big difference between brain tumor survivors and non-brain um, cancer survivors in terms of how well they do socially. Uh, we see a similar story in a recent report from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, which is a large epidemiologic study of um, childhood cancer survivors across the country and, and in some other countries. And compared to sibling controls and um, non-CNS tumor controls, um, brain tumor survivors were much more likely to report not having any friends at all, and then only, maybe only seeing their friends less than once a week, which is a significantly different than the other comparison groups. And when they wanted to kind of classify how these kids were doing socially, they, they um, in their models, they found that there are three clusters or three groups of brain tumor survivors in terms of their social functioning with a little over half being considered well-adjusted, but over but about 46% having some sort of significant difficulty in the social domain with either social deficits or poor peer relationships. So taking a step back, why, why do we even care about this at all? What, what's the importance of poor social functioning in these survivors? Um, well, the first reason is that in the recently adopted psychosocial standards for care for um, kids with cancer, um, which has been endorsed by almost every pediatric cancer organization. Um, standard nine relates to the importance of providing opportunities for social interaction for kids uh, across the cancer continuum from diagnosis into survivorship. Um, so it's something that we should strive to be doing and providing opportunities for these um, youth. And then secondly, um, we know from a host of developmental literature that poor social functioning in childhood um, leads to a bunch of other poor outcomes later on in young adulthood and adulthood. So, you know, when there's disruptions in these, this key developmental task of, of establishing friendships and peer relationships, um, then kids are much more likely to develop increased rates of psychological distress uh, higher levels of risky behavior and increased rates of suicidality. So it's important that we understand some of the what's going on in these brain tumor survivors so that we can prevent um, some of these poor outcomes. So that leads us to some important questions. What don't we know about the social problems of pediatric brain tumor survivors? Well, we don't know a whole lot about modifiable risk factors, things that we can actually change to impact risk. And we don't know a lot about what are the mechanisms for these poor social outcomes in these in the survivor group. And um, we also don't really have very effective ways of improving social outcomes in the survivor group um, when there, these difficulties arise. So there's been uh, a few different attempts to uh, run uh, randomized clinical trials 
um, using social skills interventions for brain tumor survivors, um, including some done by some of my colleagues at CHOP, um, Dr. Bearcat and Dr. Phillips. Um, and the, both of these um, kinds of, both of these groups used uh, group-based social skills interventions um, that focus on um, social skills, so like communication, nonverbal communication, how to make friends, how to take turns during a conversation. And they, what I'll say about them is that they generally assume intact or functioning abilities to interpret social information. So they kind of assume that they more focus on the actual nuts and bolts of the social interaction. Um, and across these studies, there are some small improvements in self or parent reported social skills. So their social skills do improve, which is good, but we don't really see much um, change in levels of peer acceptance. Um, so that doesn't really improve. So uh, maybe there's a different approach that we can take um, and take a step back and better understand what are the mechanisms behind these poor social outcomes so we can design interventions that target the right, um, right variables so that we can have better outcomes. Um, so what I would argue is that we need to take a step back and, and kind of think through what the kinds of research that we're doing, the kinds of studies that we are running to better understand the, the social outcomes of, of pediatric brain tumor survivors. And one way to do that is to look to models um, that have been developed on the social functioning of uh, kids. Um, and one that I look to and I think has a lot of um, utility with this research is a model developed by Keith Yates and colleagues. It's a model of um, social competence in kids with brain disorders. And the things that I, I like about it is that it highlights um, the insult related risk and resilience factors. So the type of brain injury, how severe of an insult is it? And then the subsequent brain abnormalities that occur as a result of the, the brain disorder or brain injury. And then the impact of those insult factors on different social information processing variables like cognitive functioning, attention abilities, those types of things. And then the social cognition function. So how do I interpret nonverbal communication? How do I interpret um, what do I pay attention to in a social situation? And then those social information processing variables then influence um, social interactions, how well they actually interact with their peers, and then how well those, their peers actually um, like them in terms of um, like ratings and friendship nominations and things like that. So I think this model holds a lot of promise um, for this line of research. And when I, I published a review paper um, looking at the different social functioning um, studies in this population of pediatric brain tumor survivors of several years ago. And the take home message from that, that paper, that review that we did was that there's not much out there in terms of evidence on the social functioning of these brain tumor survivors within this framework. Um, so there, there's a lot of work that is, still remains to be done. Um, in terms of the neurocognitive light effects, which is one aspect of the model, um, there's a large literature documenting the, that there are neurocognitive deficits that occur in this brain tumor population um, as a result of their tumor and treatments. Um, so that's pretty well established. There's not as much literature examining the link between neurocognitive functioning and the social problems. So there's um, work that can be done there. There's some, there's some evidence in some studies for the role of attention problems and executive function problems impacting social functioning um, in a handful of studies, but not very many. And then there are several unknowns in terms of the role of neurocognitive late effects, including um, slowed processing speed, maybe some memory impairments. How do those impact um, social functioning? What really hasn't been tackled is um, the social cognition variables. So um, facial processing, how much, what are we paying attention to in social interactions? Those types of things that has not been uh, evaluated as much, which is what I just said. So um, studies are, are really lacking in terms of um, these variables, these social cognition variables or these social effective functions. If you're looking at the model, um, understanding tone of voice, um, body language, those types of things. And some of the qualitative research that I've run and, and holding interviews and focus groups with parents of brain tumor survivors, 
they tell us that their survivors have difficulties in these domains, but there hasn't been any kind of quantitative studies that have looked at these um, in a empirical fashion to date so far. Um, the, the, there is one study that has done this and it was published in 2008 by Melanie Bonner and colleagues. And um, it compared the facial expression recognition abilities of brain tumor, brain tumor survivors against kids with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis as a kind of chronic illness comparison group. Um, and they use this task, the DANVA, to look at um, whether you can identify accurately different facial expressions. And they found that the brain tumor survivors uh, were worse than the kids with JRA on identifying adult facial expressions. Um, they looked pretty similar in terms of child facial expressions. And that the difficulties with interpreting uh, adult facial expressions were related to some of the parent-rated social problems. Um, but this was one of the only studies looking at these kinds of domains in the last 15 years or so. Um, one thing that I, I've been thinking about a lot is what can we learn from other populations that have uh, social deficits as an inherent um, component of the, the framework of the disorder. And autism spectrum disorder is, is much farther ahead um, in terms of identifying the um, different processes and mechanisms for their social deficits in, in those youth. And if we can establish that there may be some potentially shared um, social processes or social affective processes in kids with brain tumors, um, then that would be interesting to know. And if there are differences across the groups in terms of um, what contributes to the social processes, that would also be important. And the, the research that's been done in autism can then inform um, intervention efforts in, in our brain tumor survivor population. So some of the domains of interest that I'm particularly interested in my research include facial processing, so interpreting, interpreting facial expressions, and then um, social attention. What am I actually looking at during a social interaction, um, as well as the, the underlying brain mechanisms, the neurobiological processes that um, contribute to some of these abilities. So, um, now I'll jump into talking a little bit about um, some of the research that we've been doing in my lab um, focused on the social competence of brain tumor survivors. And we've, we've run a couple different studies. Um, the first that I'll tell you about was funded by the National Cancer Institute as part of my uh, career development award. And the goal of this project was to enroll um, brain tumor survivors and non-CNS solid tumor survivors um, within the six within six months of them finishing their tumor-directed therapy. So we're catching them at the early stages of being off treatment and um, early stages of, of survivorship. And we wanted to compare these two groups on different uh, social information processing abilities. We wanted, then wanted to look at what, what were the associations between these social information processing abilities and their levels of social adjustment, like um, peer relationships and friendships and things like that and then uh, evaluate different risk and resilience factors and how they impact um, these different variables. So the, the, the first um, findings that I'll talk to you about, we recently published in the Journal of Pediatric Psychology earlier this year. It's uh, exciting to get a paper out on, on these data. And so here's a little bit about the sample that we enrolled. We enrolled 53 brain tumor survivors and 34 non-CNS solid tumor survivors. Um, across these groups, there's a, uh, a mix of diagnoses, so pretty heterogeneous uh, samples uh, for both groups, um, with almost half of them receiving radiation therapy in the brain tumor group, and 45% um, in the non-CNS group receiving multimodal therapy, combo therapy. The brain tumor group tended to be uh, much more heavily male uh, than, than female compared to the non-CNS tumor group, that was a, a statistically significant difference. And the brain tumor group also tended to be younger at the age of diagnosis uh, compared to the non-CNS group. And so those, those are the covariates that we um, evaluated in terms of their relations with different uh, social processes that we are interested in. So as part of the study, one of the things that we did was we asked our, each participant um, to name a friend so that we could then contact that friend 
and administer different measures of friendship quality. Uh, and this was an interesting process for us because um, as we were doing it, we found that um, some of the survivors were not able to name a friend. They had trouble kind of identifying a friend and the parents tended to confirm this and say, yeah, their, their friends are really only their cousins or their siblings. So a lot of survivors um, had trouble naming a friend. And so when we looked at how that compared by diagnosis, we found that 38% of the brain tumor survivors could not identify a friend compared to 14% of the non cena solid tumor groups. Um, so that was a big statistically significant difference. And things that were related to the ability or inability to name a friend included things like relapse status. So kids who had experienced a uh, relapse in their disease were much more likely to be unable to name a friend. If they um, demonstrated poor facial affect recognition, so we administered the same measure that I showed you from the, the Bonner study uh, that was done in 2008. If they had poor, if they had more hard time um, correctly naming a facial expression, then they were less likely to name a friend. If they had difficulty with perspective taking on, on different theory of mind tests that we administered, it's kind of pulling from some of the work that's been done in autism, they had um, more likely to not name a friend. And if when we are kind of talking to them about different potential social dilemmas and asking them how they would interpret them and react to them, if they demonstrated a less neutral attribution style and tended to perceive things more negatively, um, then they also had uh, more difficulty in naming a friend. And so then we wanted to, um, then we evaluated the, the strength of these um, different variables um, in a larger model, predicting uh, friendship status and a log logistic regression model, um, controlling for covariates and things like that. And we found um, that the four variables in the table remained significant with some other uh, variables dropping out and not really accounting for any variability in the ability to name a friend. And the things that I'll highlight here um, are relapse status and diagnosis um, as two things to, to, that would increase the risk for um, having trouble naming a friend, as well as um, facial affect recognition and then um, attribution style. And these two things that I'm highlighting here are potentially things that we can intervene on um, with interventions uh, to improve facial recognition or uh, modify how we're interpreting different social situations, um, which gives me hope that we can potentially improve some of these outcomes. Okay, so the next uh, study that I'll tell you about was um, more focused on long-term survivors, uh, kids who have been uh, off treatment for over two years and at least five years removed from their diagnosis. And this was a collaboration um, with some of my colleagues at the Center for Autism Research here at CHOP. And um, the goal of this project was to really enroll pediatric brain tumor survivors and compare them to um, previously existing data that CAR had had um, on kids with, tip, kids with autism and typically developing youth. And we um, did one-to-one -one matching across the groups on IQ, age, and sex um, to hopefully eliminate some of those potential covariates. And um, we wanted to compare the groups across different measures of social information processing. There was a neuroimaging um, protocol that we used and levels of social adjustment. And the goal was to examine also the associations between some of these uh, variables and their social adjustment within survivors. So we enrolled kids eight, between the ages of six and 17 who were more than five years from diagnosis and two years from end of therapy. The age range was to match the existing CAR data we excluded survivors who had some sort of visual impairment that was uncorrectable with glasses. So if they had something like a field cut, we excluded them because we, um, part of the protocol involved using eye tracking technology, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And then we um, had them go through a one-time assessment that uh, mimicked what the Center for Autism Research had done um, to allow for group comparisons. So you can kind of see some of the measures that we used here. Um, so we enrolled 54 survivors into this study. They're almost 14 years of age at the time of study. Um, they were 
about six years old at the time of their tumor diagnosis, a little more females than males in this sample, um, skewed towards Caucasian survivors. And um, the majority of them, 83% had some sort of tumor resection um, and almost half had um, radiation therapy. And you can kind of see that the also um, heterogeneous in terms of different types of tumor diagnoses. So there is some variability there. So the first thing that we want to do is kind of understand the level of social impairments across groups and how they differed or were um, similar. And so we used um, two different parent report measures for this first analysis. Um, the social responsiveness scale is, is a measure that's often used in autism to quantify the level of, of social impairments with higher scores indicating more impairment. Um, and then the Vineland socialization score is another kind of parent rated measure that talks about different kinds of social relationships and social skills. But in this measure, um, higher scores indicate better social functioning. Um, and as you can see, there were significant differences across group with pretty strong effect sizes. So the groups differed from one another. Um, you can kind of see the, the means here. And the differences were such that the typically developing group performed better or had, you know, had fewer impairments or per, had better socialization scores compared to the brain tumor survivor groups who also performed better, or had fewer impairments compared to the, the autism group. So uh, the brain tumor group was kind of falling in the middle in terms of their social functioning compared to typically developing controls in kids with autism. And so some of the, the, the first findings that I'll, I'll, I'll show you here is from a paper that we also just published this year um, in neuropsychology. And this relates to our eye tracking data, um, looking at social, um, excuse me, social attention. So what are they, what are they looking at during um, social interactions? And so this study, um, in this part of the study, we used an eye tracking paradigm that um, had been used by my colleagues at the Center for Autism Research where each participant viewed 22 um, video clips of siblings playing with toys. And in half of the videos, the siblings were engaging in joint play. So they were really, and these are the, the first um, the, the clips here on the, on the left, under A, where they were engaging in, in kind of rich nonverbal communication. They were really interacting with one another. Um, and it was more in, in, engaging to watch. And then the other half of the videos, they were engaging in parallel play. They were just sitting next to each other playing, but there wasn't really any communication or nonverbal communication. And so we used infrared cameras to track where um, each participant was looking during while watching these videos. And we can map out different areas of interest and quantify how long they were looking at um, social areas of interest like faces or other objects like hands or background objects like the globe in the background. And then what we would do is we would calculate a uh, proportion of total fixation duration. So the time that they spent looking at faces, we then um, created a ratio uh, compared to the total amount of time they spent looking at the screen to kind of control for the amount of time they actually spent paying attention to the screen. And so we would calculate um, this uh, proportion for each area of interest, hands versus faces, within each condition, joint versus parallel play, and, and compare those um, values across the three groups. And when we did that, uh, we found in a three by two by two repeated measures ANOVA, we found a significant three-way interaction that I'll tell you about here. So first I'll, I'll show you the, the the data on the typically developing controls, you can kind of see what they um, looked at. So on the top dotted line is the, how much time they're spending looking at hands, and then the, the solid line on the bottom is how much time they're spent looking at faces. And as you can see, um, for the parallel condition, the typically developing, for both conditions actually, the, par the typically developing kids were looking at hands more than faces, uh, particularly in the parallel condition. But when they got to the joint condition while watching these kids being much more interactive, the level of face watching or face gazing um, went up and the amount of hand watching went down. And if you add in the brain tumor group here, um, you can see that there are some differences. The, the brain tumor group looked less at faces across both conditions, both parallel and joint, 
compared to typically developing controls um, when that was a significant difference. And then the, they also spent more time looking at hands, although those were not significant. And then if you add in the autism group here as a further comparison, um, you can see when particularly for the amount of face looking um, that's going on, the brain tumor group and the autism group look very, very similar. Their, their slopes are pretty um, close to one another and they're not significantly different. If we look at this data in a slightly different way, we, we, when we calculate the social prioritization score, um, which is the amount of face looking com compared to the amount of background object looking, with smaller values meaning less face looking and um, higher values meaning more face looking. You can see there's a, um, also some group differences here. Um, as you can see in the, in the joint condition, the, the brain tumor group is looking less at faces compared to typically developing controls. And if the same is true for the, the parallel condition, that's even a more striking difference. Um, and again, across both conditions, the brain tumor group is looking at faces a lot less than, um, I'm sorry, is looking at faces at a similar rate compared to the, the kids with autism. Um, we wanted to understand a little bit about what are some of the medical factors that are related to social prioritization um, and things like who grade pathology or WHO grade pathology, tumor location, whether or not they receive radiation therapy in their age at tumor diagnosis. Those were unrelated to their social prioritization scores. However, the, the survivors who received multimodal brain tumor therapy had um, lower social prioritization scores compared to those survivors who only received one kind of therapy, so only chemo or only surgery. Um, so to sum up the eye tracking data as, as kind of an interim summary, the brain tumor survivors showed a reduced preference in terms of looking at children's faces compared to typically developing youth. They tended to pay more attention to the non-social areas of interest, um, including hands and background objects. And this gaze pattern is similar to youth with autism. And so um, additional work needs to be done to look at, you know, how this, these patterns then relate to um, how well they do in social interactions and this, um, how it relates to how well they're actually liked by their peers. But it's an interesting um, finding and start for this. The other thing that we did as part of this study is we, we did our, had our own measure of facial processing. Uh, we used uh, the Let's Face It battery, which was designed by some researchers at the Center for Autism Research. And it looks at two different types of facial processing. It looks at whether or not you can identify whether or not this is the same person across different facial expressions, or um, is this the same facial expression across different people. And when we compare groups on, on these variables, we see that the, the brain tumor survivors and the typically developing controls perform about the same. There's not really any differences in terms of how well they're able to recognize the same person or recognize the same expression um, across different people. Um, so there weren't any differences between the brain tumor group and the typically developing controls. The autism kids, the kids with autism, um, performed worse on both of these tasks. However, we really, we also wanted to understand how well, um, facial affect recognition abilities relate to um, maybe some of their social impairments across the groups. And so we ran um, some general linear models or ANOVAs um, to see if facial affect recognition predicted social impairments um, by group. And we found that the this association between facial affect recognition and social impairments was really only significant, it really only mattered for pediatric brain tumor survivors. And this was true when we control for both age and actually IQ. Um, so it begs the question whether or not, um, if they're not, there may not be any differences between typically developing controls and brain tumor survivors, but maybe the, the ind individual variability is more important for brain tumor survivors in terms of their social impairments compared to some of these other groups. Um, we were also interested as part of the study in looking at the, uh, doing a neuroimaging protocol and looking at the brain connectivity. Um, and we wanted to do this because the model of social competence that I showed earlier really emphasizes the importance of the connectivity and the connections of different brain networks 
um, that become integrated over time as a child is developing and growing old um, through young adulthood. And if there are any disruptions to these, this connectivity process or these networks during development, um, it would then impact key social brain areas, which would then disrupt social information processing abilities, which could potentially impact how well a kid does socially. Um, so we really want to understand what are the, some of the neurobiological um, processes that are relevant in brain tumor survivors as part of this, these models. So we, um, for a subset of this sample, we um, had some of the survivors undergo a neuroimaging protocol. We collected a few different types of imaging data while they were in the scanner. We really wanted to look at diffusion-weighted imaging, which um, provides metrics of structural connectivity via white matter tracks. Um, we really wanted to understand some of the resting state connectivity, the functional connectivity, um, that has been shown to be important in kids with autism and relating to their social impairments. And we wanted to understand what, what areas of the brain are being activated or not as activated in brain tumor survivors during some social processing tasks. And so this is again was a uh, age and IQ and sex matched analyses um, compared to typically developing controls. We had 24 survivors go on the scanner. They're about 14 years old. Um, average IQ, slightly more female, um, almost half receiving uh, radiation therapy or multimodal tumor therapy. So um, the first thing that I'll, I'll talk to you about is the diffusion weighted imaging, um, which evaluated the structural connectivity through white matter tracks. We used a graph theory approach to evaluate connectivity, where we calculated um, connectivity distributions between different seed areas, uh, which then yield um, probability estimates that any two areas are structurally connected um, via white matter. And we use that process to get estimates of connectivity for both the whole brain and then um, within uh, areas within the social brain, namely the fusiform gyrus, um, amygdala, superior temporal sulcus, and inferior frontal gyrus. And as you might expect, um, which is, so the first finding is that uh, the brain tumor survivors as you might expect, had diminished whole brain structural connectivity compared to controls with very large effect sizes. And this is consistent with, with the prior neuroimaging research that's been done with pediatric brain tumor survivors showing increased risk for diminished uh, white matter connectivity. Also consistent with the literature, uh, kids who received radiation therapy was a risk factor for diminished connectivity. What really hasn't been done in the literature yet to date, to my knowledge, is um, we show here that there was also diminished connectivity within the areas of the social brain compared to um, typically developing controls. And this um, was a medium to a large effect size. In terms of our um, resting state or functional data, where we wanted to look at the, the functional connectivity um, for survivors, one at rest, when we're not asking them to do anything, we see um, reduced whole brain functional connectivity in, in this group of survivors compared to typically developed controls. Again, with medium to large effect sizes, um, with smaller non-significant effect sizes in areas of the social brain. And as I mentioned earlier, um, this is interesting and potentially important because um, reduced functional connectivity has been associated with increased um, autism symptom severity in kids with autism. So, this could be something that is particularly relevant for our brain tumor survivors in explaining um, some of their social difficulties. The last thing we had them do in the, in the scanner was um, a facial identity task um, where we wanted to evaluate the levels of activation in areas of the social brain when um, looking at different pictures of faces. So we would show them two pictures of faces and ask, do these pictures represent the same person, yes or no? And then we would compare the activation in different areas of the brain for the facial category with um, the houses where we would present two pictures of the house, two, two houses, and we would ask, are these the same house, yes or no? And so we would compare the, um, the different brain activation levels, um, face versus house by group. And so this is a, a task that has, has been used quite a bit um, by my colleagues in the Center for Autism Research 
And it's really good at um, activating areas of the brain that are known to be important for facial processing, um, namely the, the fusiform gyrus and the amygdala um, bilaterally. So both groups showed activation um, during this task, which is what we would want. However, the compared to typically developing controls, the brain tumor survivors showed decreased activation, um, particularly in the medial portions of the fusiform gyrus bilaterally. And this was significant even when we were comparing, um, um, doing multiple corrections and things like controlling for those things um, for family-wise error correction. And so, we ran some, we've run some preliminary analyses trying to uh, understand how these imaging metrics then relate to different measures of social functioning, social behavior, social adjustment. Um, and we found that uh, the uh, levels of whole brain global structural connectivity, um, higher levels of connectivity are related to better facial affect recognition ability. So the stronger the connections in the white matter tracks the more accurate these children were in terms of identifying um, facial expressions. And similarly, the higher um, connectivity was related to better parent rated social skills. In terms of the resting state data, higher connectivity was also related to better parent rated social skills. And then um, within the fMRI uh, face identity task, stronger act activity in the bilateral fusiform gyrus, um, so on both sides of the hemisphere, was related to more accurate facial affect recognition. And then stronger activity in the left side of the fusiform gyrus was related to um, better rated, self-rated social acceptance. However, conversely, stronger activity on the right uh, in the right fusiform gyrus was related to more social impairments and poorer social relationships. So there's some um, hemispheric differences in terms of activity level and relating to um, positive outcomes versus negative outcomes, which is interesting. All right, so to recap the, the neuroimaging data, we, um, some of our initial evidence, our emerging evidence is showing, as you might expect, there's some diminished brain connectivity in this group of survivors um, in terms of structural connectivity, um, which is consistent with what has been seen in the literature to date um, with the role of radiation showing uh, increased risk for diminished connectivity. And then similar to what has been seen in children with a autism, uh, there's also diminished functional connectivity um, globally. Uh, in the MRI, fMRI task, we saw reduced activation in key facial processing areas. And some of these connectivity metrics were related to different um, measures of facial processing and social impairments. So in terms of next steps, we, do, we, would, we would really like to um, repeat some of these uh, procedures in larger samples, um, particularly samples that are more homogenous in nature. So maybe only focusing on cer certain types of tumors uh, or locations or certain treatment protocols to minimize some of the variability that might be seen because of diagnosis or treatment. And then we really like to do this longitudinally so that we can really map on the impact of treatment on brain connectivity and how those changes over time then relate to social functioning. Okay, um, so wrapping up here, some takeaways from this talk would be, um, we are in our, in, our lit in our early data, we're showing some reduced social functioning in um, both long-term survivors and in those survivors who are uh, more recently off treatment We've shown some of the importance of certain social information processing skills uh, as they relate to different um, social outcomes, particularly um, with the highlighting the potential role of uh, reduced attention to faces during social interactions, and that um, there are some diminished connectivity in brain areas that are important for social information processing, which might uh, serve as a neurobiological mechanism for those things. So again, uh, the next steps, uh, we would really like to do some longitudinal research. We have a couple grants that will be reviewed soon to do some things like this to um, map out some of these processes and factors over time. Um, it, it's really important to, to eventually be able to determine who's most at risk um, for some of these problems um, so that we can then inform screening and prevention efforts uh, and allocate resources more efficiently.
Um, and then if we demonstrate the impact of tumor treatments on brain connectivity and social information processing abilities, then maybe we can inform different types of risk adapted therapies um, to minimize damage on areas of the social brain and reduce the, the level of social difficulties that we are seeing in survivors. And then there's a, a whole area that's ripe for um, work in terms of intervention development that could be informed by what's already been done in uh, the field of autism, um, which could consider the role of family or peers. Um, some things that could, could potentially be interesting to look at in the future are the role of facial processing training. So there is some pilot data and some samples of kids with autism that shows that facial processing improves facial ac uh, recognition accuracy as well as um, enhances the brain activity in brain areas in youth with autism. Um, there have been some pilot work um, interventions that reinforce gaze um, at uh, socially relevant areas, um, including the faces. So that might, that holds promise potentially in, in, in our population. And then there have been a couple trials um, that have shown that intranasal oxytocin um, enhances uh, social attention and social reciprocity skills in kids with autism um, may also be of interest um, down the road. I'd like to, to thank again Alex's Lemonade Stand for inviting me to talk here. I also want to acknowledge the team of collaborators and mentors who have really helped shape this research over time. And um, I can wrap up here and uh, turn it over to, to Jay to see if there are questions or discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, very interesting talk. I want to get the question started. Um, and my question is, do you think the lack of the ability to recognize face, faces is, is part of the problem for having friends or for thinking they have friends? Is, is, that, is that part of the root of the problem? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it definitely plays a role. Um, if, you're having, if you're having difficulty reading some of the nonverbal information um, I mean, kids can be sarcastic and um, mean sometimes. And if you're not picking up on the, the nonverbal information that is being put out there by faces or other body language or something like that, and you're misinterpreting that, um, you may not react appropriately in those situations. And then over time, you repeat that often over and over again, you're, you're going to probably be viewed as, you know, different or off or aloof or something like that. Um, and, I, and I've heard parents talk to, to us about they their kids seem aloof you know they don't seem as interested and that could be because they're not really paying attention to faces they may be looking at other things or they're just not reading and responding appropriately to some of the nonverbal things that are happening um, in a conversation or interaction and i think if you add those things up over time then you tend to get kids who become more isolated who don't get asked to do things as much and that's that's what we see in the in the data on brain tumor survivors when we ask their peers, they tend to be viewed as more lonely, isolated, um, rejected. And these are things we don't even think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, it's such a natural skill for us. And so we don't really, it, we tend to take it for granted that in, people tend to just develop this naturally, but in certain populations, um, that process may get disrupted either because of a developmental genetic issue or because there's some sort of um, injury uh, related to a radiation therapy or brain, uh, a traumatic brain injury or something like that. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, the next question comes from our, our good friend Liz, Liz Scott. Um, and she said, have there been any studies that look at social competencies of kids at diagnosis versus at survivorship point and then she said, in other words, does the process slash treatment change them or were they behind in this area to start with? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there have been some that have looked at kids who are on treatment. Um, I believe uh, Bob Knoll's papers have looked at kids who are on treatment. Um, they didn't focus on brain tumor survivors, if I'm remembering correctly. And those were data that showed the kids look pretty similar. Um, 
I mean, the kids with brain tumors and kids with other kinds of cancers all have similar, similar risk factors. They're missing school. Um, you know, they're, they're having other physical challenges as a result of their treatment. Um, but when we look at the outcomes for non-brain tumor survivors after they finish treatment, they look pretty similar. Is the, particularly the survivors of brain tumors who are multiple years removed from their treatment and their, and their diagnosis that they tend to look different. Um, it's really hard to do um, studies that look at like right around the time of diagnosis because things are just chaotic and, and it's, it's not the priority of families. And so, um, and then for brain tumors uh, in particular, there are a lot of uh, diagnoses that, you know, in the tumor could have been growing slowly for many, many years. And it's, we don't really quite understand the impact of tumor growth in general on later brain development and how that may have played a role. So a lot of um, interesting messiness sometimes in, in doing this research. A lot of unknowns. Um, the next question comes from Yuan, Yuan Pan and says, hi, Dr. Hawking. In terms of the social interaction deficits of brain tumor survivors, did you see any effect from genetic predisposition syndrome such as NF1? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, kids with NF1 also show uh, difficulties with cognitive development and social impairments. Um, in the data that I showed here, we, we excluded children with neurofibromatosis. Um, I have a separate line of research um, that is looking at NF1. Um, and that is a genetic condition that where part of the phenotype is social impairment problems with attention regulation, some other cognitive or learning difficulties. Um, and so when you have a kid with NF1 who goes on to develop, let's say, an optic glioma, um, it's really hard to disentangle are some of their presenting issues because of the NF1, the genetic contributions, or is it because of the tumor or both? And so um, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, group. And I have a, a separate line of research where we can hopefully answer um, some of those kinds of questions. Um, what are the processes that relate to social impairments in kids with NF1 outside of having a tumor? Okay, the next question comes from Karen Wallheider, and then Liz has a follow-up, which is kind of similar. Um, from a clinical standpoint, how do you address some of this research with parents in terms of skills training and support? And then Liz followed up with her previous question saying, are there things parents whose kids are in treatment for brain tumors or who have survivors that, that could be doing things to stay ahead of this? Yeah, these are great questions. And um, I don't, we don't have data to support any of these, my answers. Um, I think it, it's more based on kind of theoretical rationale. But what I would say is I think um, these are skills that develop over time with uh, experience and exposure. And so it may mean that for these kids, um, uh, more increased opportunities for interaction um, and overt kind of like labeling of emotions when you're watching shows or something like that, that would help them get experience in um, interpreting different social information. I mean, I think that's a challenge these days now as we're in this kind of COVID quarantine environment and it'll, it'll be uh, you know, something to watch in terms of how kids in general um, adapt in terms of their social functioning when they're not around their peers as much anymore. Um, but I think that that would be one thing that you could, we could do is, you know, um, just increase exposure, get them in, in different social uh, opportunities, clubs, um, you know, groups, things like that, when we can, are able to go back and do that um, post COVID. So practice. Yeah, I would say practice and repetition. And it may mean um, overt kind of like coaching um, in the moment sometimes or, you know, shortly after um, in terms of how you recognize and, and interpret what the other person is doing or thinking and feeling. Um, so that's something in the, the combination of practice versus kind of coaching um, might be a good thing to try. So I know we're running out of time here, but Liz had one follow-up question. Um, 
do we know if they do better in one-on-one -on -one or group socializing? Um, I don't think we, we have the data on that. I think uh, anecdotally, I think if, there, if it's more one-on-one, -on -one, it's probably less. Um, there, there are multiple factors to consider. Um, brain tumor survivors often have delayed processing speed. And so one thing that's still unknown is how much does their slower processing of information they may still be able to process information, but they just do it much on a much slower basis. And so um, you would think that if, if that is the case and there's underlying difficulties in interpreting social information, they would do better if it's one-on-one -on -one rather than large groups, um, the more, less be able to be distracted and kind of focus in on what is actually important and relevant. Um, and these are things that we're hoping to study moving forward. We have grants that are under review where we'll be um, recording and, and videotaping different social interactions so we can kind of look at social behavior um, in a, and feed it into some machine learning programs and see what, um, what we can identify as where the, the issue is in terms of the, their social interactions, at least on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Okay, another question came in from Claire Gruber. Says, hi, Matt, do you have suggestions for social workers meeting families with new brain tumor diagnoses? In terms of early referrals, um, you would suggest that may assist with long-term coping skills. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's a tough position to be in because when you're first meeting a family and they're de dealing with diagnosis, the, the long-term implications of their child's illness and treatment is probably not on their top of their priority list. And so I think it's, it's something where you can, um, I like to encourage families to, particularly with um, you know the levels, increased rates of survival and, 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 and treatments getting better and better, to think about their child as um, you know living a long time and and um, and what kind of person you want them to become later on. And so that relates to how you parent them. That relates to all kinds of things. But um, if you do that, you can kind of sprinkle in um, things to think about, like with school and with um, social opportunities there the the hard part is that there's not a whole lot of there's not a whole lot of groups or organizations or um, resources out there for brain tumor survivors in terms of facilitating social interactions or social skills groups or things like that um, there are much more resources for kids with autism um, there are a lot more kids with autism so that makes sense but this is kind of a, a hidden population that has real needs and may not necessarily be addressed because um, there's just not, there, we have a hard time finding appropriate things to refer to families to address this kind of issue. Um, so it, it is a struggle. I, often, I feel bad when people ask me that question because I don't really have great answers. All right, Matt, well, we're up against the clock here. So I guess that would be the, the last question, um, but we really appreciate your time. It was a very interesting talk, really important stuff and, you know, really important to these brain tumor survivors to find better, better interventions that, that can help them, you know, with their social skills as they go through life. Yeah. Um, maybe we can learn from, from the autism community and in, in things that they're doing. And um, so we appreciate your time. We appreciate everyone joining. And um, if anybody has any more suggestions for, for future talks, again, uh, Jen will, will put up the survey to, in the chat real quick and um, you can click on that and let us know. But thank you, Matt. Appreciate your time. Hope you Absolutely. guys you. stay well and uh, tell Eli that we said hello. <laughs> I will. All right. Bye, guys. All right. Bye, Matt.